Hey guys, Jay here with Word of Advice TV, and this video will be about how to read an air conditioner wiring diagram. How to read the symbols on it, how to trace the wires, see where the power goes first, and what do all the different symbols on that wiring diagram mean. And then I want to go over some wiring diagrams from other units, and lastly, I'll go over the wiring diagram of this unit and trace the wires with the help of the wiring diagram from this one right here, so you can see it live, how to trace wires according to the wiring diagram. All right, so here's the first wiring diagram we're gonna go over. And if you don't get it right away, don't worry about it. I mean, this is actually kinda hard to understand right off the bat. We're actually gonna go over three of these wiring diagrams. So hopefully by the time we're done going over all of them, you will have a much better idea of how to read a wiring diagram for a condenser unit. And this is just the first one. There's the second one right there. And of course the third one underneath. And the printouts look a little bit curved or maybe even lopsided. And that's just because this is literally pictures that I took from condenser units that I worked on. And to be honest, I don't quite remember what units these were. I believe they were a carrier, a Goodman and a train. I just wanted to take pictures of different wiring diagrams so I can show you different examples of what you'll see in the field. So I took pictures of these wiring diagrams and I went to Office Max and I blew them up so they're a lot larger so we can actually see what's going on. And of course, all of these wiring diagrams can be found on the access door to the condenser unit, you know, where all the electrical stuff, a lot of times on the back of that door is where this wiring diagram will be. So when I just start looking at a wiring diagram, I like to look at the whole picture I like to look at the little tables that they have, any notes that they have, any legends. So the color code is right here. You know, everything is abbreviated on the wiring diagram. So BK stands for black, R for red, Y for yellow, and so on, so on. You got your wiring codes. High voltage wires are gonna be thick, bold lines like that right here. The thinner lines are gonna be our low voltage lines, like right over here, going to the contact recoil. And a wire nut will be symbolized as a circle made out of dashed lines. So there's really only two of those wire nuts right here in the whole diagram. So that was the first column. The second column says field wiring. And then the third one says wiring for factory options. So both of these, see how they're dashed lines? That means that they may or may not be in the unit. And what that basically means is... Factory wiring means that the wires are already in there, in the condenser unit, they come with the whole unit. Field wiring, this is wiring that has to be added in or installed by the installer, whoever's putting in the unit. These wires do not come with the unit. And then wiring for factory options just means that those wires may or may not be there. For example, the unit might have a start capacitor or it might not have a start capacitor. If the start capacitor is in the unit, that means those wires are going to be there. You're not going to have to provide your own wires. And then on the bottom here, it has some more notes. It says, replacement wire must be same gauge and insulation thickness. So for example, if mice chew up a bunch of wires and you're replacing wires, this note is telling you that really, whenever you're replacing those wires, they should be the same gauge and same insulation thickness as the old wires that you're replacing. And before we begin looking at this wiring diagram, I just want to go over some quick symbols and some things that you should know, common HVAC schematic symbols. So wires connected are usually going to be signified by a dot like this if the lines intersect. If there's a dot in the middle, that means there's a connection point there. Either they go to the same terminal connections or there's a wire knot that connects these wires together. Wires that are not connected, usually if there's nothing in the middle here, like a little wire knot picture or a dot, that means those wires typically are not connected. And on some other wiring diagrams, wires that are not connected, one of the wires will actually jump over the other wire in a loop, just like that right there. Then you have contacts. And what a contact means is it's basically a break in the circuit. So this is a piece of wire. This is a piece of wire. And typically this will be a contactor. So for example, it'll go to one side of the contactor and then stop there. And then until the plunger pulls in, none of the voltage gets through. So it's a break in the wire. And the NO right on top of it stands for normally open. So this is a normally open contact. That means that until this contact recoil gets power, this always stays open. And on the contrary, this one right here, NC stands for normally closed. 
This symbol stands for contacts that are normally closed. So until power is supplied, in a normal condition, this one right here would be normally open, and this one right here would be normally closed. And I know this might sound a little confusing, but just bear with me. When we start going over the wiring diagrams, you're going to understand that a lot better. Then you have the pressure controls. So right here, once again, that's a wire, that's a wire. And right in the middle right here, this is a symbol for a switch. So for example, let's say your furnace power switch, right? This is what it would look like. You have a line coming in. So a wire coming in, you have 120 volts coming in, right? This is your furnace or your air handler power switch or any lights for that matter. So right here, this is a symbol for an open switch. So let's say your lights are off. This is what it would look like on a wiring diagram. Now, if you turn your lights on and you flip that switch, this switch will close and allow the 120 volts through or whatever the voltage is. So that's a switch up on top, but right below it, this plunger looking thing, that's the symbol for pressure. And this will typically be your low pressure cutoff or your high pressure switch on the air conditioner condenser unit. Most wiring diagrams are read left to right, just like reading a book. So if you read it from left to right, see how this switch goes on top of the dot right here? That means that this switch can only go up. So this would be our high pressure switch. So the high pressure switch would go up and interrupt the circuit if the pressures are getting too high in the refrigeration system. And this one would be the LPC, the low pressure cutoff. So as you can see, the switch is under the dot, so it can only go down. So if the unit is running and the pressures inside of the system are getting too low, the low pressure cutoff will go down and interrupt the circuit and turn off your unit. And then we have thermostat switches, and they work very similar to how the pressure switches work, except they're activated by temperature thermostats. So this one would open on temperature rise, and this one would open on temperature drop. So these are some of the common HVAC schematic symbols, and there's actually a ton of them. I won't be able to cover them all. And when we come across them in the wiring diagram, I can just explain them as we go. And just two more things I wanna draw. So a squiggly line like that is a resistor. So this is a winding that consumes power. So if there's power coming into it, either 240 or 120 volts, this is a symbol for a load. So this resistor right here, it actually resists the flow of electricity, so it gets hot when power is supplied to it. Whereas a magnetic winding or a coil, these inductive windings, they consume power as well, so they're also what you would call a load, inductive winding. They consume power, so they use electricity, so resistors are primarily to make heat, whereas inductive windings are used to move something, like a motor or a compressor, for example. So if we look at our wiring diagram, right here we have inductive windings on our compressor, over here as well. So it's the round squiggles, whereas the crankcase heater, which is used to heat up the compressor crankcase, is jagged like that, because it does get hot when power is supplied to it. And that's about it for the basics. Let's actually get back to the wiring diagrams and start taking a look at them. So on most wiring diagrams, you're gonna have two sides to them. On the left side, you have the connection diagram or the point to point diagram as they're sometimes called. And the purpose of this diagram primarily is to show you which color wires go to which components. And then all the components are actually in one place. So the contactor, for example, is all in one piece right here. But in the other side, we have the ladder diagram, and the ladder diagram is used more for troubleshooting. It's read from top to bottom, left to right, and the components are not necessarily in the same place like on the point-to-point -point schematic. So for example, see how the contactor is all in one place right here? You have the T1, L1, T2, L2, and then the contactor coil. Whereas on the ladder diagram, you have L2, T2 right here, you have L1, T1 right here, and you have the contactor coil right over here. 
When I was going to school and studying electrical diagrams, this was one of the hardest parts for me to understand, that the same component can be in multiple different locations. I mean, I can understand this, you know, where it's all in one spot, but when it's all split up like that, that makes it a little bit more confusing. But hopefully by the time we're all done, you're gonna understand how it works and you're gonna understand why it's split up like that as well. So let's begin. And I think we'll actually start on the ladder diagram and we'll start from the low voltage. This is one of the only wiring diagrams I could find that has such a nice low voltage diagram. Most of them will only have something that'll just say R and Y and that's it. They won't have this whole thermostat part of it. And when we look at the other wiring diagrams, you'll see what I mean. This is basically the only condenser wiring diagram I was able to find that had such a nice diagram for the low voltage part of things. So I definitely took a picture of it and let's go ahead and go over how this part of it works. So right here, it says that we have the indoor power supply and this is in the furnace or air handler. In most cases, this is gonna be 120 volts. So you're gonna have 120 volts hot coming in on one side and then you're gonna have your common on the other side. Label that as C. So that's basically power coming into your furnace or air handler. So the red will pretty much be a live circuit. So that's going to be our 120 volts and we'll use blue for common. Like that. On most wiring diagrams, this will not be connected. See how there's a line right there and right there. That really shouldn't be there because this is 24 volts and this down here is 120 volts. So those lines should not be touching like that. And then we have this symbol right here, which is three lines. And then you got the windings on either side. This is a symbol for a transformer and this is a step down transformer. So it gets 120 volts and it steps it down to 24 volts. So basically the furnace is getting 120 volts, the power gets to the transformer, the transformer steps it down to 24 volts, and power goes in to R, and we'll just follow this line. Once this is energized, power immediately goes through all of this and energizes all these lines wherever there's no breaks in the wire. That means that power is immediately there once the power is turned on to the furnace. So power just comes in and sits in all these points right here. And this is a diagram of a really simple thermostat. So the thermostat has a fan setting switch. You know, the fan, you can set it to either on or auto. This is the switch. So this bar right here, I'm gonna go ahead and color that as yellow. So basically this bar will be the thermostat switch for the fan. So if you move over the fan switch on this thermostat from auto to on, it will automatically, once you flip that switch to on, so this bar will go over to here and this will send power through the G line, which goes into the fan relay coil and once the fan relay coil energizes, that will turn on the blower fan inside of your furnace. And this is the common coming out of that fan relay coil. So as a reminder, this transformer is getting 120 volts and it's putting out, putting out 24 volts. So this whole red line on top here, after the transformer, everything is 24 volts. So we turned our fan switch from auto to on and this closed this circuit and it went through and energized the fan relay coil, which in turn powered on our blower motor inside the furnace. But of course, this fan switch has nothing to do with the furnace or the air conditioner. This simply controls the fan, the blower fan inside of the furnace to either come on 24 seven or stand auto. When it's on auto, that means that it only comes on when the furnace is on or when the air conditioner is on outside. So let's go back to where the power stopped over here, right over there. And as you can see, here's our 
power switch on the thermostat. So you can, it's on off right now. This little bus bar is on off. And then you have a cool setting and a heat setting. So right here, we have the contact points. So right there, we have an open circuit, right? There's no power going through these lines right here. And if you move this bar, if you move the thermostat switch either down or up, up will turn on the cooling and down will turn on the heat. So right here we have our thermostat bulb. This is one of those bulbs that has the mercury in it. So it reacts to the temperature in the room. You know, if it gets colder or if it gets hotter, this thing will move up and down accordingly. So it's almost like that temperature switch that we went over earlier. So whenever the heat goes up, this will open or when it goes down, it'll close. Works in a very similar way, except it has anticipators. You know, it has the cool anticipator and the heat anticipator that you can adjust on the heat cycle of it. I won't go into all of that in this video because that's just way too much to cover. But basically, let's say we will turn this bar to cooling, which will close this circuit right here. And let's say that we set our thermostat to 72 and it's actually 82 in the house. So if it's 82, this little switch, this thermostat activated switch will actually swing up. So it'll go up for cooling and it'll make a connection with this point right here. So once it makes a connection, power will go through and energize the fan if you have it set to auto. If it's an on, then your fan is gonna be already on in the furnace or your air handler. And then it'll also send 24 volts to Y. And Y sends 24 volts out to the contactor coil, which is in the air conditioner. So 24 volts goes in, and then the 24 volt common goes back to the common on the thermostat strip in the control board. And I forgot to draw the common on our 24 volt side, but that basically goes to the same spot. And I know we're not talking about heating here, but same thing would apply in the heating. So if we set our switch down to heat, that will close these two terminals. So it would close these two right here. Now we have power going through. And if our temperature in the house drops down, this little mercury bulb will drop. Remember, we're talking about a really old thermostat here. This will drop and make a connection between those, those two points right there. Power will go through and go to W, which will power on the coil that turns on your heating. And of course, I forgot to color our switch yellow here. There you go. Now the picture is complete. So that is gonna be our 24 volt side. Let's say that we set our thermostat to cooling and the temperature inside the house went up so the power went through and energized our contactor coil. And what that contactor coil does is close the contactor contacts that are normally open. Remember how we went over the normally open contacts? So this is normally open. So it's just sitting there open. But whenever this contactor coil closes up, whenever it gets power, it pulls down the contactor plunger and closes this normally open switch and allows the 240 volts to go through. So let's see what that would look like. So from our disconnect box outside, we have two hot legs coming into our air conditioner unit. Both of them are 120 volts. By the way, this is another common question asked between the new guys. And that's something I asked in the beginning as well. Where is the common? And actually on a 240 volt AC unit, there is no common. You just have two hot legs that give you 240 volts. And if one of these hot legs is missing, let's say one of the disconnect fuses is blown and you're only getting 120 volts, nothing will turn on because the compressor and the fan motor, they both need 240 volts to run. 120 volts will not turn these things on. So we have 240 volts coming from L1 and L2. So L2 comes in, this is a single pole contactor because it only has one brake, whereas this side does not have a brake. See how it says contactor, contactor, but there's no brake on this one. So it's a single pole contactor. There's only a brake on one side. So just one plunger instead of two. Let's draw a quick picture so we see what that looks like. 
So let's say this is our contactor, right? I know my art is terrible, but these are the two plungers. So these brass plates that are attached to the contactor, they are the ones that close and make a connection. So for example, you have your two wires that come in from your disconnect, right? Usually one is going to be red, one is going to be black. So you have 240 volts just sitting here, right here. Probably under two screws. Then you have two more connectors right here. So you got a wire here and a wire here. This is going to be your 24 volts, right? The contactor coil itself is actually under the contactor. So once the thermostat calls for cooling, this contactor, when it's energized, pulls down these plungers. There's another screw right here with wires coming out. It pulls down this contactor and these brass plates make a connection and they allow the 240 volts to come through. So this is a two pole contactor and the one that we're looking at right here would be the same thing except it'll only have one plunger and the other one is just going to be a brass bar or whatever metal it's made out of that connects right to the screws. So this unit actually always has 120 volts just sitting there. Always 120 volts there. But the second one right here, the second 120 volt leg, pulls in only when the thermostat is calling for cooling. And because both of these motors require 240 volts to run, 120 volts alone will not be able to turn them on. Let's just see how that looks like. So one leg comes in and power just sits there because this is a normally open switch. This one, on the other hand, will actually send power down all of these wires right here. So it'll look like that. And then right here we also have a crankcase heater it says on the bottom, if used. And I think I'll just go over that briefly in other wiring diagrams. So in this case we'll just go ahead and pretend that there is no crankcase heaters. And where I live, for that matter, I barely ever see crankcase heaters. I guess it depends on the area you live in. But anyways, no crankcase heater here. And there's one more thing that I didn't talk about. There's a compressor internal overload switch right here. So it's that squiggly switch. That means it's a temperature switch. If the compressor gets too hot, this switch will go up and interrupt the circuit and turn off the power. So for example, if the fan motor burns out or if the capacitor is dead for it, the compressor will run and run and run until it overheats and this little overload will pop open and turn off the power so the compressor doesn't burn itself out. And this right here is the symbol for a capacitor, either a start or a run capacitor. So let's just add that to our list right here. So this is a capacitor. And even though this may not be technically correct, I like to explain it to customers, the capacitor, I like to tell them that the capacitor is like a battery, a car battery for an engine on a car. Same with the capacitor for the air conditioner. It's like a battery for the motor or for the compressor in the unit. So if the capacitor is weak or dead, then the motor or the compressor might not start or it'll try to start but fail. So we have 120 volts on one side and then our contactor coil gets energized, pulls in the plunger, and that will close this normally open contact into a closed contact when that plunger pulls in which allows power to go through and energize our fan motor and our compressor on the start windings and the run windings like that and electricity travels at about 174,000 miles an hour 
So this is pretty much instant. Once the plunger pushes in, everything gets energized all at once. Like that. And even though this motor, the fan motor, doesn't have a little overload symbol like that, notice how it says I-O on the fan motor right here. Same with I-O right here. The I-O stands for internal overload. So all fan motors and all compressors do have a internal overload installed in them. So if the motor overheats, it will shut itself down to prevent burning out and stuff like that. So for the 240 volts, this wiring diagram is about as simple as it gets. I didn't see too many other ones that were this simple. This right here, the low voltage was a lot more complicated than the high voltage actually. So that was the ladder diagram. And the connection diagram is gonna be the same exact thing, except it's set up differently. So let's take a look at our connection diagram. Right here, it says connect to appropriate control circuit having 24 volts. So in our case, that will be this thin solid line right there. This is coming from inside the house, from the control board or from the thermostat, basically from the transformer that's sending out the 24 volts. We got the hot leg and we got the common leg or the common wire. Usually it's going to be a two wire thermostat wire going outside to the contactor. So right here, it's a purple wire and a purple wire, PU, which stands for purple. And there's two wire nuts signified right here. And that just means that the thermostat wire that comes out of the house, usually is just going to be a white and a red wire. And a lot of times those two wires will go into wire nuts and another wire will come out of them, which will be the color that goes to the contactor coil. So in our case, a purple and a purple. And if you look at our ladder diagram, here's our contactor coil right here, which is the same thing as this contactor coil right here. So there's the common, and here's the hot 24 volts that comes from the Y on the control board. And then we have our two hot legs, the two 120 hot legs to give us the 240. Those are going to be installed by the technician or hooked up by the technician. So that goes in, stops at the contacts right there that are open. Whereas this one just goes right through and energizes these two wires. And like I said, we're not going to go over the crankcase heater this time. But that's going to be right here. The black wire is going to the crankcase heater. And as you can see, there's dashed lines which once again means field wiring or wiring for factory options, which means that it may or may not be installed at the factory. And I've noticed that a lot of times when they say that may or may not be, that usually means it's not there. But anyways, power goes here and stops at the L2, just like it did right here. And at L1 and T1, we just have that brass bar since it's a single pole contactor and power goes all the way through Let's just go ahead and color these wires like that. So the black wire going to the fan motor is energized. And then the black wire going to the compressor, to the compressor common, is also energized. So this would be the same as the ladder diagram. You know how the power went to one side and it just stands there on standby? This is not labeled, but let's just go ahead and label it. This would be the common. Here's our windings. They normally don't draw windings on motors, but this is what it would look like. Keep in mind that capacitors are always gonna be in series with the start winding, always. So this will be the start winding, and this will be the run winding, like that. So just like on this picture, 120 volts comes and sits at the common on the fan motor and at the compressor. So let's say the thermostat calls for cooling. The contactor coil will be energized and pull in the plunger and that will allow the power to go through from L2 to T2. These contacts that are normally open will close. Power goes through and if you trace your wires One will energize the run winding. The other one goes to the capacitor, which in this case is actually a dual capacitor. 
like most modern units will have. And that energizes the common and a jumper wire goes from the common onto the fan motor and then the power goes through the start winding on both the compressor and the fan and respectively goes into Herm and fan on the dual run capacitor. Like that. So everything lit up except our crankcase heater and we just finished tracing the condenser high voltage wiring. And one note that I forgot to point out in the beginning, it says right here, alternative double pole contactor. So some units may have a double pole contactor like it shows right here. So it says L1 to T1 will have a break and L2 to T2 will have a break. So this side right here, if you have a two pole contactor, will also have a break right over here, which will be a set of normally open contacts. And last but not least, even though this is field wiring, let's add some green to this chart. We got our ground. Bam. So your ground wire coming from the disconnect whip will go into the screw right there. All right, guys, and that's about it for this wiring diagram. So we're done with the first one. The other two will go a little faster, of course, since now I already went over all the basics. So here's our second wiring diagram. It's also a pretty simple one, nothing too complicated. And unlike the first one that we looked at, this thermostat diagram or the low voltage diagram just has a Y and a C and the contact recoil and that's it. So as you saw, the other one was way more detailed. But just like the last one, let's look at the whole picture before we dig into the wiring diagram. Right here, you see the color codes. Once again, everything's abbreviated. So BK, black, BL, blue, so on, so on. We have the wiring code, what the different wires stand for. We have the component code. So CM, outdoor fan motor, IO, internal overload, LVJB, low voltage junction box, so on, so on. Junction box is right there. And then on the bottom, it says controls shown with thermostat and off position. So all these wiring diagrams, they're showing what they would look like with the thermostat off or the thermostat not calling for cooling. But if the thermostat was calling for cooling and the system was running, for example, these contacts right here from the contactor, they would be closed. And this switch from the potential relay and the start capacitor, this switch would be open. And pretty much all wiring diagrams are like that. They're basically controls shown with thermostat in the off position. So the unit is off on any wiring diagram that you're reading. And in the bottom here, we have three notes in the notes section. So note one is right here about the low voltage. Note two is by the hard start capacitor, SA. This is start assist. And note three is about the equipment ground. So let's just read them all quick. The first note says to indoor unit, low voltage terminal block and indoor thermostat. So Y and C go to the indoor thermostat or to the indoor unit. Note number two says start assist factory equipped when required. So this is the start assist. This would be similar to like an SPP6 hard start kit. And then also we have a start capacitor right here and the potential relay right over here. And one thing I want to point out is that a unit will never have both of them. It will not have a start assist like this and a start capacitor with a potential relay all together. It'll either be these or this one alone, not both of them together. And if you noticed, it's in dashed lines. That once again means that it may or may not be there. And like I said previously, most of the time that means it's not there. But in our scenario today, we will pretend like it is there and everything's wired up. We'll disregard this guy, the start assist. This one's really simple to wire. Basically one wire just goes to Herm and the other one to Common. Nothing complicated about that, but the potential relay is a little bit more complicated. So we'll trace the power on that and see how it goes, but we'll disregard this little guy. So let's just go ahead and kind of scribble that out. Won't be using this. And just like on the previous wiring diagram, we have a one pole contactor and on the side right here, it shows you alternate double pole contactor. 
So either or can be used. And it's kind of interesting, on this one they actually used both. So they have a single pole contactor in this picture, but over here on the wiring diagram they actually have a diagram with the two brakes, which would be a two pole contactor. And then they just have a note right here, alternate double co pole contactor only. So with a single pole, of course, this would just be a straight line. So let's go ahead and begin with the ladder diagram for this one. And on the ladder diagram, just like last time, we have our 240 volts. But since this is a two pole contactor, both of our hot legs, the two 120s, they give us the 240 volts. They stop right there, right when they come in from the disconnect and go into the contactor. They stop and the 240 volts is just on standby until the thermostat calls for cooling. And I previously mentioned that you read wiring diagrams from left to right. This time though, looks like they put the switch on top of the left circle or the connection point. I-O, so that's the internal overload, but it, it would work the same, you know. When this temperature switch, when the temperature gets higher, the switch will go up and interrupt the circuit. Same with the internal overload for the fan. But stuff like this constantly reminds me that there's nothing definite in HVAC. It seems like there's always more than one way to wire something, more than one way to read something, to draw something. There's always multiple names for a single component. So I never claim to know it all because it seems like there's always going to be some more information that comes up down the road that will change my way of thinking. But anyways, we have our two hot legs coming in and just standing by and our low voltage they didn't give us much to go off of, just Y and C, and then the contactor coil right here. And actually, you know what, I'll take this opportunity to draw us a really simple thermostat instead of this. So, here's our transformer, right? It'll look something like that. I know this isn't the most perfect picture, but let's say this is our 120. And this is our 24 volts. This will be our R, the hot leg. This will be the common. And we'll pretend that this is a little wiring diagram of our thermostat. So this is the R at the thermostat. So let's draw our switch for W. This will be the heat. Here's our little temperature switch. The next one will be our switch for cooling which would look like this and will be Y and last but not least we got our switch for fan which is going to be our G on the bottom so that's what that would look like and then all of these will go to some kind of a coil Y of course is going to our contactor coil we'll just call that our contactor coil W, which is heat, that will go through some limits and then to a load, like a gas valve coil, for example. We'll just call all of these loads. And G would go to a fan relay, call that one a load as well, and then go to common. I'm drawing it all in red, but this would normally be blue or a common. So this is what a little thermostat would look like right here. And this is totally handmade. This is my version of a thermostat, I guess. So let's pretend we have a switch right here. This will be our fan switch. And I'll go ahead and color half of it in because this fan switch is in the auto position. And then we have the on position right here. And then on the other side of the thermostat, we have another switch. And this one is in the middle position because the middle position is off. The right position is cool, and the left position will be heat. So, with the thermostat set to auto, and the thermostat set to off for the heat and cool, this is what the little wiring diagram for it would look like. So, this temperature switch right here, if the house is getting too cold, this temperature switch will go down, boom, and then make a connection with W, which would turn on your heat. If your thermostat is set to the heat mode, if your thermostat is set for cooling, see how this temperature switch is normally down? But if the house heats up, this switch will gradually go up until it makes contact with that point right there, 
And then it sends power to your contact recoil, turns the air conditioner on. On almost all thermostats, whenever there's a connection made to Y, the fan, the blower fan inside of the furnace will automatically come on. And with the W, whenever there's a connection made to W for heat, the fan will always come on after the furnace heats on. That's why it's automatic. And this switch is normally open. But if you switch this switch to on, then this switch will close, and you're going to have 24 volts constantly going to your fan coil or your fan relay inside of the furnace, and that will cause your blower motor to run all the time 24-7. So that's our little picture of our thermostat. Hopefully that helps paint a little bit of a better picture. And let's get back to our main diagram here. So we have the furnace control board sending us 24 volts to the contactor coil. And then the common is coming back to the control board. And once this contactor coil is energized, that will close our normally open contacts, which would look like that. And will instantly energize pretty much everything here. So let's go ahead and just color everything in because once those contact or contacts close everything gets energized but of course we're not using the SA right the start assist so this I'll just scribble out not going to use that and we'll go ahead and color in the rest everything gets energized the condenser fan motor the compressor. And once everything is lit up like a Christmas tree, your air conditioner should be running. And one more thing I want to talk about here is the start capacitor with the potential relay. This one's a little bit harder to understand, but I'll try my best to explain it. So power goes into your potential relay, which has three terminals on it that are labeled five, two, one. So if you look over here, this is our potential relay right here. Five, two, one, they actually have it in one place. Here it's in a line format. So here's our potential relay and there's a normally closed switch right here. That's for the start capacitor. And then this normally closed switch, since it's closed, power goes through and powers one side of the capacitor and the power coming in from L2 powers the other side. And that energizes our start capacitor. The thing about the start capacitor though, it's only in the circuit, in the electrical circuit for like a second or maybe even less to help the compressor, only the compressor, not the fan, the start capacitor is always only for the compressor, it's only in the circuit initially, in the beginning, to help kickstart the capacitor and then it's taken out of the circuit. And the way that is done is by back EMF. Whenever the compressor is up to full speed, the back EMF, or the current feeding backwards, heats up this resistor up on top and once this little coil has enough power going to it, it actually pulls this switch, this normally closed switch, into an open position, which takes the start capacitor out of the circuit. Because now at this point, if this is open, that start capacitor is only getting 120 volts, but it's not getting the other 120 to actually power it up. So the start capacitor gets taken out of the circuit, but the run capacitor stays in the circuit all the time. So while the unit is running, the run capacitor always stays in the circuit. And I know that my start capacitor and potential relay explanation was probably not the most crystal clear explanation ever, but I don't want to spend this whole video trying to break this down and explain the start capacitor. So if you're interested, just look up some articles on how a start capacitor works, a 521 start capacitor, and they should break it all down for you and explain how that all works with the back EMF and all of that good stuff. So that's it for the ladder diagram. On this side, this one was pretty simple, nothing too complicated on this one either. Let's go ahead and just color in this side. So right here, we have L1 and L2. They don't have any wires going to them, but we'll just draw our two hot legs like that, our two 120s that give us the 240. And of course, on this picture, there is no break in the contacts, so power goes all the way through. But before we keep going, I just want to take this opportunity quick to draw a disconnect, what a disconnect would look like with the two fuses. Okay, so let's say this is our two hot legs coming from the AC 
breaker or the circuit panel inside your house. So you have 120 volts, 120 volts, two hot legs, right? They come into your disconnect and it would look like this, right? You'd have two switches. I call them switches, but it's normally a plug or some kind of shut off. You know, on your disconnect, if you pull the plug, it disconnects the voltage. So this dashed line right here signifies that this is a two pole switch. So if you turn one switch off, the other switch turns off as well. Or in our case, if it's a disconnect, if you pull the plug, then this will interrupt the circuit. So you have the two hot legs coming into the plug or the switch or the breaker or whatever it is that you have in your disconnect. And then most disconnects will have a fuse. Those cartridge fuses that are usually like 20 or 30 amps. And those guys are symbolized by this squiggly looking thing. That will be a fuse. So anything that looks like this on a wiring diagram, that's a fuse. And if you see something like this, Sorry, my art is not the best, but basically two hooks facing each other like that, that would be a circuit breaker. So, breaker. So after the fuses, the two hot legs will go into your contactor. So L1 and L2. And then the 240 volts will just idle by or be in standby until the thermostat calls for cooling. So what we have set up here, this is coming from your circuit panel. It goes into your disconnect. This is your plug. This is your two fuses. There's the contactor. That would pretty much be the full picture of this right here. This is what goes into L1 and L2. See where this contact is, that break? That's where this would start. I didn't see any condenser wiring diagrams that showed this part of it, so I just wanted to draw it quick so you have an idea what that would look like too. So that's what that would look like. And now let's just continue with our drawing. So power goes in. This side right here, L2, stops at the open contacts, whereas the other side powers up your black wires. One of them goes to the compressor, common. The other one goes to five on your potential relay. And the last black goes to the common on your condenser fan motor. So with the thermostat off, L2 is on standby and the other hot leg, 120, goes right through and energizes these three points. So number five on the potential relay, one side of the coil right there, the common on the compressor, and the common on the fan. But once again, these motors, they need 240 volts to work, so nothing is running at this time. And when the contactor energizes the contactor coil, that means that the thermostat is calling for cooling. It got hot in the house. Then we get power that comes down into the contactor coil, which is right here. And then goes back through the common over here. And once the contactor coil energizes, this closes these contacts or this contact right here between L2 and T2 and sends power through to the rest of the circuit. So one wire, the red wire goes to common Another red wire goes to the run winding. And basically, pretty much all the other wires that haven't been energized do get energized if the component is in the system. So there you have it. Everything is energized and the unit is running. That's what it would look like when it's fully energized. And let's go ahead and color our ground green just because I like seeing some green on this chart. Bam, now it's properly grounded. And of course, once the compressor is up to speed, then this normally closed switch on the potential relay will open up and take the start capacitor out of the circuit. So then only the run capacitor, the dual run capacitor right here, will stay in until the unit shuts off. 
Well, and that's about it for this wiring diagram. Let's go on to our last one. This one is actually vertical. So let's see, I don't think I'll be able to fit it all on the screen. Like I said, I went to Office Max and blew these up. This is like, I don't know, probably seven times larger than the thing on the inside of the condenser unit there. So just like the other ones, we have our schematic diagram, the ladder form on this side, even though on this one, even though it says it's a ladder diagram, notice how the potential relay is all in one spot like that. Also the dual run capacitor in one spot, it's not spread out. So this is not exactly a true ladder diagram. They're just trying to make it a little bit easier to read. So we got our ladder diagram on this side, the connection diagram on this side. And unlike the other diagrams, this one actually has a bunch of notes and information on the bottom side. And of course, just like I mentioned previously, it's always a good idea to look at all the notes and just read through and see if there's any special instructions before you get to looking at the wiring diagram and trying to diagnose your system. There's way too much information on here, so I'm not going to read it all. It has some caution notes like compressor damage may occur if system is overcharged. That applies for pretty much every air conditioner. It even has a superheat charging table on the right side right here. These charging tables are a little bit confusing. I would rather use a slide chart or a slide rule or maybe an app on your phone. So I rarely ever even look at this. I don't use this. But if you're somebody that uses charts like this, then you would find this helpful. Although many times by the time we get out there as a technician, this chart is completely faded or chewed away by mice or like you see right here, scratched off, pretty much gone. But anyways, that's that. They have some notes. Other wiring diagrams that we just looked at only had like three notes. This one has 14. And I think what they're doing is actually spelling everything out and not just assuming that you know like the other wiring diagrams are. So for example, it says right here, compressor and fan motor furnish with inherent thermal protection. That means that the fan motor and the compressor both have that internal overload, and usually all of them will have that, but this wiring diagram actually spells that out in the notes. And then it has some simple stuff like number 11, it says check all electrical connections inside control box for tightness, or number 12, do not attempt to operate unit until all service valves have been opened. And number 13 is a good one. It says, do not rapid cycle compressor. Compressor must be off three minutes to allow pressures to equalize between high and low side before starting. So it's bad to rapid cycle a compressor to turn it on, off, on, off, on, off. And a lot of modern thermostats will have an internal time delay in them. So if you turn the thermostat off and back to cooling, it'll delay it. It'll delay the start of the air conditioner by five minutes. And that pretty much takes care of the short cycling problem. But anyways, there's a bunch of good notes in here. Cooling only procedure, it spells out the cooling procedure. So for example, operate unit at a minimum of 10 minutes before checking charge. So you don't wanna hook up your gauges and check the charge right when the unit starts up. You gotta allow the time for the pressures to stabilize before you check. And there's just a bunch of other good notes that you could find on here. And they have a pretty nice legend. It's well organized. Unlike the other charts where they had it in a few different sections, this one tends to keep it all in one place except they don't explain what the wire colors are, but most of them are pretty self-explanatory. BLK stands for black, YEL, yellow, BRN is brown, of course, and so on, so on. So all good stuff. Before looking at that, I would glance through this, kind of read through it, and make sure there's no special notes that you're missing. But now that we're done with all the notes, let's move on to the actual wiring diagrams. And like always, we'll start at the ladder form and then move on to the connection diagram and see if there's anything interesting here. Okay, so here's our external power supply that gets us to 24 volts, the transformer. So our transformer sends 24 volts to R on the thermostat terminal strip on the control board. Actually, there's some transformers that have R, W, C, G, and Y on the transformer itself. That's kind of old though going away, but there are some transformers out there like that. So we have 24 volts going to R. And then of course we have our commons all hooked up to C. From the indoor fan relay, from the liquid line solenoid valve, 
and from our little logic control board or basically our little circuit board. And then G right over here, of course this would only be energized if we set our fan, the thermostat fan setting to on instead of auto, then that would send power down to our indoor fan relay and turn on our blower motor in the furnace. And before we continue, let's just point out the few new components that we see on this wiring diagram that we did not see on the previous two. So on this one, we actually have the HPS, DTS, and LPS on our low voltage side. This is the high pressure switch, discharge temperature switch, and then the low pressure switch, along with the liquid line solenoid valve. We didn't see any of these in our previous wiring diagrams. And the liquid line solenoid valve is just there to basically prevent refrigerant from flowing while the unit is off. These liquid line solenoid valves are pretty rare, or at least in my area they are. I practically never see liquid line solenoid valves on condenser units. And the discharge temperature switch is also pretty rare. I practically never see those either. And the purpose of this switch is pretty much the same as the high pressure switch, except it's activated by temperature. So if the temperature of the Freon pipe, the discharge line, is getting too hot, then this thing will go up right here once the temperature gets too high and interrupt the circuit and turn off the power to the unit. And when I say turn off the power to the unit, that means that when this thing goes up, the closed contact, if your unit is running, the plunger will go up on the contactor and then that will open up and interrupt the 240 volts that is feeding the unit and turn everything off. And as you can see, all of these switches are normally closed. So in a normally operating system, all of these switches are normally closed all the time unless there is a problem. That's the only time when they open up. And another new component is this little board right here. It says CTD, which stands for Compressor Time Delay Board. And the purpose of this little control board is to prevent the compressor from short cycling like we talked about previously. And this little symbol right here is the symbol for a time delay switch. And I'm not gonna go into the science of exactly how this works. It's a pretty simple control board. It basically delays the start of the compressor by like five minutes until it closes back up and allows the power to go through. So let's continue with our tracing. When the thermostat is calling for cooling, Y gets power, it gets 24 volts, and here's the symbol for a wire nut. And as you can see, there's two paths that the wire can take. It can either go here and go through all these switches, or it can go up here and go to the contactor coil. But notice how it says note 14 on top of this wire right here. And note 14 says, this wire not present if HPS, LPS, DTS, or CTD are used. Which basically means that if your unit has this one, this one, this one, or this one, at least one of these switches or this little control board, this wire will not be present. But if your model does not have any of these switches, then this is the wire that you would go by. And in this particular wiring diagram, we'll just say that there is no liquid line solenoid. So let's scratch that out. And like I was saying, this is very rare, at least in my area, don't see these a lot but we'll keep all of these in the circuit. We do see the high pressure switch and the low pressure switch quite a bit. And of course, since they are in our system, this top wire is not present. So the 24 volts that comes from Y will go to the high pressure switch, out of the high pressure switch, into a wire nut, which connects to another wire, which goes to the DTS, discharge temperature switch, goes into the switch, comes out of it, then goes into the low pressure switch. And of course, if any one of these is open, then the power can't go through. So once the power to 24 volts goes through each of these switches, it goes into the control board. If the time delay switch is closed, then the power goes through and energizes the contactor coil right there. And since we haven't been doing any kind of troubleshooting scenarios, let's just do one quick on this one. So the Y is sending out 24 volts, right? 24 volts. And I mentioned previously that ladder diagrams are mainly used for troubleshooting. I just wanna show you how that would look like on this one right here. So we have 24 volts 
Coming in from our Y, this will be our common. Basically any of the white wires or any of the wires coming out the other side of the component will be our common wire. If you're not sure which wires are the common wire, then you can look on your connection diagram and see what color wires are which. So if you see right here, we have the common coming from the 24 volt side of the transformer. That goes into the contactor coil. And then the two wires that hook up into this wire nut are black and brown. So the black wire and the brown wire is going to be your neutral wires. Or you can just put your meter lead, if you're checking it with the meter, right onto this point right here. On this side of the contactor coil. So, let's say you have 24 volts, right? You're checking with your meter. You put your meter lead right here. One meter lead goes here. And you stick your other meter lead into this wire nut right here and you measure 24 volts. So between this point and this point, your meter is showing you that you have 24 volts. Yet, for some reason, your contactor is not pulling in. That means that either one of these switches is open or the time delay switch is open. And an easy way to check that is to just go down the line. You will keep one meter lead on the contactor coil common and just start checking at all these points. And they're not going to be actual terminals, they're probably going to be wires going into wire nuts. And that can be seen on the connection diagram. So see how the blue wire comes into the high pressure switch? Blue wire comes out of it, and then it connects into a black wire. Usually through a wire nut, goes into a discharge temp switch, comes out as a black wire, goes into a wire nut and comes out as a yellow wire, goes to the low pressure switch, and then the yellow wire goes into that control board. So let's get back to troubleshooting. You still have your meter lead right here, and you check from here to one side of the high pressure switch, you have 24 volts. You check it to the other side, you still have 24 volts. You check it to this side, 24 volts. And then you put your meter lead here, you get 24 volts, but when you put your meter lead on the other side of the low pressure switch, all of a sudden, you're getting zero volts. If this low pressure switch was actually open, let's say it was right here in the open position, and you put one meter lead here and the other meter lead here, this is no longer a closed circuit. Now you're going to have 24 volts showing up on your meter. And in our example right here, the time delay switch is closed. So if you go from the other side of the low pressure switch to the common of the contactor coil, you'll still be reading zero volts. And I'm kind of sidetracking now. This is taking a little longer to explain. Maybe this is a topic for a whole other video. But basically, your contactor coil should be getting 24 volts at the coil. So if you put one meter lead on one side of the coil, the other meter lead on the other, you should have 24 volts. If 24 volts is not there, that means somewhere along the line between Y and the hot side of the contactor coil, something is interrupting that circuit. Or it may simply mean that either the thermostat or control board is defective and it's not sending voltage the 24 volts into the Y. But anyways, that's our low voltage circuit. Let's switch over to the high voltage circuit now. We got our L2, which is field wired. That goes into one side of the contactor. L1 goes into the other. And just because I love coloring grounds, we'll color our chassis ground. Boom, looks like that. I feel happy, we can continue. And actually, let's just sidetrack very briefly once again. Let's say you put your meter lead right here and your other meter lead right here and you're checking voltage with everything on, with the power on. And with your two meter leads on there, you're only getting 120 volts. Even though this is two hot legs, usually if everything's working correctly, you should be getting 240 volts, not 120. So in that case, what do you think can be wrong? Most likely, you either have a burnt or broken wire in the disconnect or if your disconnect has those cartridge fuses in them, one of those fuses is blue just for one of the legs, but the other fuse is good. So you're getting 120 volts instead of 240. Once you replace that fuse, then you're going to get your 240 volts back again. And since we went over the start capacitor in our last wiring diagram, we'll just cross out the potential relay since it's optional on this wiring diagram, everything that has a star on it. That basically means look in the notes. And in the notes it says that this is optional. It may or may not be there. So no start capacitor on this one. 
but in that case we might as well just use the start assist which is this right here we'll go ahead and leave that in the circuit and once again we're going with a one pole contactor instead of a two pole contactor so the l2 sends the power right through and one side of the circuit is always going to be hot that's what it'll look like right there And on almost all wiring diagrams, I know this sounds kind of weird, but the common on the dual run capacitor goes to the run winding on the compressor. Not the common on the compressor, but the run winding. The common is just a common point for the compressor and for the capacitor. So the common from the capacitor is hooked up to the L2 side of the contactor, whereas the common from the compressor is hooked up to the L1 side of the contactor. So let's say that our thermostat is calling for cooling and we have no problems here. So the coil is energized and these normally open contacts get closed. And now power can instantly go through. It goes through, energizes the other side of the compressor, which powers up the start and run windings. Power also goes into the outdoor fan motor, energizes the windings goes to the fan side of the capacitor, also over here, goes to the herm, the compressor goes to the herm side of the capacitor, which also energizes the other side of our start thermistor. And this is pretty much a start assist, so it's only in the circuit for maybe a second until the compressor is up to speed, and then this little resistor heats up, and then it opens up and interrupts the circuit and takes this start assist, the start capacitor, out of the circuit. And with everything energized, the unit works like a champ. And one last thing that we haven't covered in any of our wiring diagrams is the crankcase heater, which is optional. A lot of units won't have them, but some do. And the way that the crankcase works, just briefly, is this heater will only come on if the unit is off and if this thermostat is closed. So if it's cold enough outside, this little switch will drop down and then close this circuit and allow the current to go through. And then up here, we have a resistor that heats up and basically heats up the crankcase on the compressor. So as you can see, this is almost like a bypass that goes over the brake in the contactor. So regardless if there's power or not, this thing is wired in so it bypasses it. And the way it works is when this switch closes, when there's a call for cooling and the thermostat energizes the contactor coil, when this switch closes, since electricity is lazy, whenever this switch closes, electricity will choose the path of least resistance, which is this, pretty much a straight wire over the resistor and the thermostat up on top. So once there is a call for cooling, the electrical path will go this way instead of going through the crankcase heater. So like I said previously, the crankcase heater only works when the unit is on and if it's cold enough outside where this thermostat will close and allow the power to go through. And the way that works is simply because it's wired to go around the break in the contactor. So unlike the rest of the components, the crankcase heater pretty much always has 240 volt access to it. So you got the L2 coming in from one side stops right here. There's a break that prevents everything else from coming on, but the crankcase heater is wired around that normally open contact to enable it to turn on when it's cold outside. So anyway, we're done with the ladder diagram. Let's go take a look at the connection diagram and let's color some stuff green over here too. There's the chassis ground. Here's the equipment ground. Look at all this nice green color. Very good. So, if our thermostat is calling for cooling, 24 volts will go down Y, and the liquid line solenoid we're not going to mess with. We'll cross that out. And then power will go down to blue wires from the wire nut. And just like note 14 said, remember, this only applies if none of those switches are in this model of the air conditioner or the condenser unit. So we'll cross that wire out. So from Y, it goes into the high pressure switch, then into the discharge temperature switch, 
and then to the low pressure switch and then from there it goes to the logic or the little control board time delay board and goes out into the violet colored wire and hooks up to the hot side of the contactor coil and then the common side goes out and goes to the common on the control board just like this and this logic part on the compressor time delay board actually uses energy so it does need a common so the common as you can see it hooks up right to the other side of the contactor coil where the common is and then it goes back the same path into the common on the 24 volt side of the transformer. And let's just sidetrack for a second here. Let's say that you don't have a multimeter with you and your contactor is not closing and you suspect that this compressor time delay board is the culprit. So if you don't have a meter to check voltages with, what you could do is put a jumper, either little alligator jumper wires or just some piece of wire or take the connector that goes into T1 off of it and take the connector that goes to T2 and then you can wire knot those two together or somehow connect them together and that will be an easy test to see if it's the board that's bad or not. And I've seen quite a few of these time delay boards go bad where it'll be stuck open and it won't let the power through and you're sitting there waiting for 10-15 minutes and no matter how long you wait this thing doesn't close and doesn't let the power through and if you jumper this board out then everything comes on. In that case you know that the problem is your control board. And you can do the same thing with the low pressure switch. If you think that the low pressure switch is the problem, let's say it's stuck in the open position, you could disconnect the wires from either side of the low pressure switch and pretty much bypass it. So it would come out of the discharge temperature switch and then go straight to T1. And if everything turns on, then you know that the problem is the low pressure switch or maybe you really are low on refrigerant and this thing was opening up so much times that it just eventually got stuck in the open position. And one last thing I want to point out is if you're doing this jumper method to test things, you can only jumper switches. If you jumper a load, a resistor or a winding or some coil, that will be a direct short and you're going to pop some fuse in the best case scenario. Or if there's no fuse, you're going to start burning out components. So for example, you can jumper T1 to T2 because that's a switch, but you can't jumper out the logic part of the board. So you can't put a jumper between T1 and T3 because that would be connecting the 24 volt hot directly to the common, which will give you a direct short. And since that part is important, let me just stress it one more time. Any kind of switch, you can bypass it for testing purposes. So a normal switch, or maybe it's a pressure switch or one of those temperature switches, time delay switches. You can bypass switches all day long and it's okay. Of course, this should only be done for testing purposes. You should not leave any switches bypassed because they're there for a reason. So you can bypass switches, but you cannot bypass any loads or resistors or any windings or coils because that would give you a direct short. So I just wanted to stress that point after I explained to somebody how to jump or something, I don't want them to go jump or something and short something out. And we decided that we're not going to use the start capacitor on this wiring diagram. So this gets crossed out. We're not going to use the wires going to it either. And now let's go ahead and quickly trace the wires on the hot side. So here we have L1 and L2 coming in. By the way, whenever you're looking at a connection diagram, on a ladder form, of course, you're looking from the top where L1 and L2 comes in. Whenever you're looking at a connection diagram, a good place to start is to look for the L1 and L2 or for the power supply. So you're always gonna start from there for the high voltage and then start tracing from that way. So you have L1 and L2 coming in to give us the 240 volts. We have normally open contacts here, so the voltage stops there and is on standby. And it's actually pretty warm outside, 
So our crankcase heater is not turning on, it's just kind of on standby as well. And since here we have a straight bar, one of the hot legs goes right through the 120 and energizes one side of all of our high voltage components. And when the thermostat calls for cooling, this normally open contact closes up and allows power to go through. So power goes in and energizes the other side of the compressor, the fan motor, and that start capacitor or the start assist that only stays in the circuit for a second or two until the compressor is up to speed. So everything else gets energized and starts running like a champion. So let's say that while the unit is running, it's running, 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 and for some reason the outdoor fan motor starts to seize up and the fan motor just stops working. It turns off. So it still has power, but the fan motor stops spinning. In that case, the compressor will keep running, 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 and the pressures are going to build up and build up. And since pressures correlate to temperatures, the higher the pressure, the higher the temperature, eventually it'll get too hot. And this little guy right here, the internal overload, will pop open and interrupt the circuit, which will turn off our compressor. And from my experience, whenever these internal overloads do pop open, they take a very long time to cool off and close back up. That's why sometimes some technicians will actually take a hose and water and actually start watering down the compressor to cool it off so that thing closes down. Because there are times where you replace the capacitor or you already had enough time to replace the whole fan motor and this thing still did not reset and the compressor is not turning on. Okay, so we're at our final unit now. And if you look at the wiring diagram, first of all, you want to look where the power goes into. So right here, we have 208, 230, power supply. This is where your two hot legs come in. The 120, 120, which gives you the 230, 240 volts. And the dashed lines, of course, means that it's field wired. So in our case, L1 and L2, this 230 volt power supply is going to be coming from, in most houses, it'll be disconnects. So here's the disconnect, and here's the metal whip, and it goes right into our air conditioner. And here are the two wires that come out from it. This is L1 and L2, and then you also have a ground wire that just gets attached to the chassis on the air conditioner. So this is our main power supply right here going in, and then we also have this cord right here. This is going to be our thermostat wire, which goes into here, goes into wire nuts. And from here, it goes to either side of the contactor coil. This is going to be our 24 volts. So on the wiring diagram, right here, you got L1, L2. It goes into one side of the contactor, as you can see. And here is our contactor coil with that little load symbol right there. So when the thermostat calls for cooling, power is sent through Y, goes through the high pressure switch, then the low pressure switch, and the DTS, which in our case means discharge temp switch, most air conditioners will not have that. In fact, this unit that we're looking at right now doesn't have the HPS or the LPS either. So in our case, it just goes straight, doesn't have a little compressor time board either, the time delay. It goes straight to one side of the contactor coil, and then common from the furnace control board goes to the other side of the contactor coil. So as you can see, the wiring diagram is a lot more confusing than what we actually have in the unit. In the unit, we just have two wires coming from inside. From Y and C on the thermostat strip on the control board, it goes straight out right into the contactor. But on the wiring diagram, you have all this mess, all this stuff that's in series with it. Or on the connection diagram, you know, you got all this stuff that's in line with it. And keep in mind that Carrier uses this wiring diagram for many of their different model air conditioners. So they have the same wiring diagram for a bunch of different models. That's why they have this note here that says may be factory installed. So that means it may or may not be there. So a lot of these components on the wiring diagram are actually not gonna be in your unit. So after power is applied to the contactor coil right here, the normally open contacts on the contactor, that little plunger, gets pulled in and power goes through. On this side of the contactor, so if we look at our contactor right here, see how we just have a straight bar? That means power is constantly on. You have 120 volts always sitting there. 
So in terms of the wiring diagram, you have L2 that comes in. So one side of the compressor and the fan, the run windings are always gonna have 120 volts just sitting there. And as you can see on the wiring diagram, 120 volts also goes to the common on the capacitor. So you have 120 volts just sitting there. When the contactor coil closes and sends power through, that sends power to the other side of the compressor and the fan and turns both of them on. And on the ladder diagram, it doesn't show you what colors the wires are, but on the connection diagram, it does. So for example, if we look at our compressor, which is right here, the compressor has a blue, a black, and a yellow wire coming out of it and connecting to our capacitor and contactor relay. So let's see what this looks like on the unit. Here are my wires that come out from the compressor. Here's the yellow, here's the black, and here's the blue. So one of the yellows goes to the contactor, the black goes to the other side, and the blue goes to the capacitor. So if you look on the connection diagram, we got our yellow, goes to one side of the contactor where it has the straight bar, no plunger. So if we look at the contactor, here's that yellow wire, it goes to the contactor that is straight, 120 always there. Then we look at the black wire, trace it over, that goes over to 21 on the other side of the contactor. And as you can see, there's the wire from my compressor going to the other side. And the last wire, which is the blue, goes from the start winding on the compressor and ends up on H or Herm on the capacitor. So here's the blue wire and indeed it goes to Herm on the dual capacitor. And the last thing we have is the condenser fan motor on this unit. We got a yellow wire coming out of it, a black and a brown. So the brown goes to the fan on the capacitor, the black goes to one side of the contactor and the yellow goes to the other side of the contactor on 23. So let's take a look at that. The yellow wire from the fan, I already traced them ahead of time, is actually gonna be right here. It goes to one side of the contactor. The black coming from the fan is this one right here. It goes to the other side. And then the brown, like we saw on the diagram, goes to the fan on the dual run capacitor. And that is actually all the components that this unit has. So really this unit, all it has is the contactor, the capacitor, the compressor, and the condenser fan motor. It doesn't have the rest of the stuff, the little control board. There's no fan delay board. There's no compressor delay board. There's no low pressure switch, high pressure switch. There's no solenoid valves. There's no discharge temperature switches. There's no crankcase heater on this one. You don't have a hard start kit or a start capacitor with a potential relay. All that stuff is missing on this one. So just one more time, just because the wiring diagram is crowded with a bunch of components, that does not mean that the air conditioner you're working on will actually have all these things. Oh no, it looks like I forgot one red wire. And that's the R, the 24 volts coming from the transformer to the R on the thermostat strip. Ha, there you go, now we're complete. Well guys, and that's all I had actually for all the wiring diagrams. This took a lot longer than I thought, but I hope you got a lot of useful stuff out of it, a lot of good information. You learned a little bit more about how to read diagrams, what the different components mean, and all that kind of stuff. As always, thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to mash that like button on the way out, and don't forget to visit the comment section in the comment section below under the video because a lot of times they have a lot of good conversations going there and a lot of the content shared there is almost as good as the stuff shared in the video itself. So make sure to check that out. Maybe leave a comment of your own. Tell us what you thought of this video. If you saw any mistakes that I did perhaps, of course, the longer you talk, the more chances you have for making mistakes. Let us know in the comments below and I will stand corrected. Well, guys, until next time, peace. And if you're still here and not in the comment section below, let me ask you something. Have you ever watched that cartoon, How to Tame Your Own Dragon, or at least heard of it or seen it in the stores? Allow me to show you just where they got that idea by taming a dragon of my own. As you can see in this video, I've already located the dragon that I wish to tame, and now all that's left is persuasion. I must persuade this little dragon that my finger is a better perching post than that little branch that he's sitting on. Nice! Dragon successfully persuaded. Now I've tamed two dragons at once before, let's see if I can do it again. 
Ah, unfortunately those two dragons were incompatible. And since practice makes perfect, let's tame a few more. So there you go, I got another dragon. Unfortunately my phone camera is not focusing on this little dragon so you can't see the fine details. But he's right there, wings flapping in the wind. And when I'm done hanging out with my dragon, I go to put him back in the branch. But, after my finger, that branch is not that interesting anymore. And by now, I got some good practice, so check out how good my persuasion skills got. Bam! Another dragon tamed. 